Are you a great communicator? Because you know, it's the heartbeat which runs through the veins of possibilities. Being able to communicate is being able to relate. Amy Struggs knows all about effective communication. She spent more than 20 years in the media industry as a television host a singer, a sales professional, and so much more. Throughout her journey in the spotlight, Shrugs has always held true to the principle of listening and the concept of being concise. And now she takes her worlds of experience to assist business owners, executives, leaders, and anyone who wants to be a more concise and effective communicator. Along the way, Shrugs hopes that she brings an element of hope, wisdom, and influence of inspiration to ensure that those that she has a chance to impact deliver their message crystal clear and she joined me this week to have an in-depth conversation about effective communication, compassion, and leading with empathy. It's the end of the week, so let's do us all a favor and end it on a positive note by engaging in conversation with Shrugs. I'm Kevin McShan. Let's have this conversation Kevin, I've been looking forward to this so much. And I, I do love discussing communications and entrepreneurship and just, you know, improving ourselves as a whole that helps us be effective in everything we're doing because communications and, and that right mindset doesn't just help our business, but also completely goes into our personal lives and just makes everything more cohesive. So I'm ready to have a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, as am I, absolutely. And I know that you spent nearly 20 years in the TV realm, and you're now a motivational speaker helping uh, business leaders sort of refine their uh, communication messages so that they can reach more people and have a more cohesive message. So I'm wondering if you can tell me what makes you so fabulous. Oh, goodness. No, I'm, I'm just Amy, and that's what I tell everybody. You know what it is? It's been the ability to shift all of these years. I have a 20 year career that started in sales in wholesale mortgage in Southern California. And I learned very quickly, even when I was learning the business and didn't know what I was doing yet, that effective communication and being able to connect with people was going to be that success model to be in a new industry. Because there's a lot of times we step into new businesses or trying something new, or at least hopefully most people are, because we don't want to do the same thing all the time. And <laughs> there's no need to stay stuck. But when we're learning something, if we can really relay who we are, deliver a, a concise message, then we can evolve and advance and keep adding more tools. And for me, that's what it was. I was comfortable in front of people. So as I was learning, I was able to communicate and I was able to say, hey, I, I may not know that answer right now, but let me get that and get it back to you. And I would always use effective communication to, to model to my clients the type of worker that I was and the type of professional that I was. Fast forward, I also had then the opportunity to step full-time into my music career because in 2008, the mortgage industry and real estate industry disappeared. And we hit that recession and I had to shift. And so I took my passion for being in music and performing, which I had been doing my whole life. I took the business and communication skills from being a sales professional and combined those 
into my touring career, which I went on to open for some of the biggest names in country music and be the spokesperson for the American veterans. Again, it was it was communication that allowed and business skills that allowed those things to be a success. And in 2011, I stepped back into the business world and leading sales teams, stepped into TV hosting and still performing and kept combining careers. I kept shifting. It's like a toolbox. And as I went along the way, I kept throwing more tools in until I could build bigger houses. Right. And so here I sit, here I sit with new music out and I'm a professional media coach, public speaker. I still do television. I still sing and I still love helping professionals of all industries. So it's been a really, really fun journey that I never see it as different things, but I see it as all one thing. And that's why we're here today getting ready to have this great conversation. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I always said that life is a constant game of learning, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. If we're not learning, we're not growing. And if we're not growing, we're stuck. And yeah. I don't ever want to be stuck. Absolutely. You know, I mean, with all of your experiences, I'm fascinated to ask you, what do you think is the best or most valuable or profound professional lesson that you've learned throughout your career that you apply uh, to your personal life? I'm not afraid of failure. What I'm afraid of is regret. And I think taking and eliminating fear. I mean, of course, there's always little fears in there. I'm a human being. But really being afraid of the root of failure, because I know if I develop the right habits, daily skills, and communication techniques, that I can overcome a failure and take it as a beautiful lesson that maybe was preparing me and promoting me to the next thing that I'm supposed to be in. Failure is just a a lesson. Failure is a guide. It's not really a failure. It's really a projection into the next thing we're supposed to be doing. So for me, I feel the most valuable tool has been eliminating that. And I know a lot of of individuals that don't take those next risks, don't invest in themselves, don't take opportunities because they're afraid of failing. And now they live with what if, and they really don't know what their possibilities could have been. Absolutely. And you know, I I shared with you uh, before we got started today, so I was uh, born with cerebral palsy. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, next month is actually, actually National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month. So wow. when we look at uh, employment specifically for folks in the media who, want, who have a disability, how do you think we can make the media space a more inclusive space? Yes, it should. It absolutely should be a more inclusive space. And I think it's great individuals like you, Kevin, that are saying, I'm I'm willing to put myself out there. I'm going to be loud. I'm going to be a face to represent. And I think that we all need to be completely inclusive with all walks of life, with all cultures, disabilities, not disabilities, and say, okay, we want to start respecting everyone more as individuals and and start listening more and talking less, I think is also gonna help. Part of communication is also listening. It's a huge part of communication because if it, a message isn't received, if it isn't heard. And so the more we can start listening to others' messages and really receive and be able to respond on those messages and make a difference, we just stay stuck and we're a lot of people just kind of shouting at each other or just trying so hard to get our message heard, but listening is is more important than the communicating. And when you combine the two together in the right way, it actually can be magical. And I think that the more listening could become a magical turning point. You know, I mean, in the famous words of Judge Judy, she always said that uh, God gives you a two ears and one mouth for a reason, yes. right? Exactly. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah, well, you know, if more people would implement that, we would we'd be making more progress, wouldn't we? Yes, you know, even an example uh, on this platform, and we're doing a podcast, and there's other, you know, wonderful podcasts out there. And a lot of times, as, as a guest, we may have the the tendency to come on and just know, okay, I got to get my talking points. I need to say what I need to say, and not listening to the host of where they're leading you. 
Yes, we can still stay on our talking points, but there's a powerful thing in communications and especially in doing a good interview that requires that intent listening in order to keep the interview on track, in order to keep it engaging, in order to make sure that you're keeping it pure to where it's supposed to be and what the purpose, because every platform has a different message or a different theme. And if I want to stay on theme, then I really am relying on my host, just like you, to be leading me in that direction so I can give you my best. Yeah, absolutely. And everyone, you work with business people. I'm curious, in today's business age, how do you you help people sort of use the digital world to their advantage? You know, it's it's funny, Kevin. There was the way that I was helping professionals before COVID. And it was those that really knew, okay, they want to be on TV or they want to be on radio and and they knew this is what they want to do. And so there was some kind of a focus. They would acknowledge where they were uncomfortable, didn't know their message. They maybe rambled and filler words and the different things that we can work on in perfecting our communications. But what took place in 2020 was all of a sudden everyone was on camera. We went to this new, really detailed virtual world that you can't avoid it. I guarantee anyone listening to this, you will be on another Zoom again. You will be in another virtual meeting. So now you have support staff, administration support. You have everyone in every aspect of the business, not just the entrepreneur himself, but everyone that now needs to be on camera and be effective in their skills and being in virtual meetings and presenting and representing themselves and their business. So it really expanded my outreach as far as saying these these skills are important. If you're in a virtual meeting, it is important that you frame yourself correctly. Look at the camera. Engage the same way that you would if you were sitting in person. And so there's been an expansion that now I'm not just working with the entrepreneur or the business owner so they can go and represent and be on TV or be on podcasts or radio and promote their business. I'm now coaching the support team to say, listen, here's how you're going to level up how you're representing yourself. And here's how your virtual meetings can be more effective. And here's how a team, you guys can come together in this virtual world and represent yourselves more effectively. So it's been really fun to see that transition. But at the end of the day, this really does involve everyone. I mean, almost everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's like raising a child, right? It takes a village, right? We can apply that to uh, communications as well, right? Yes, yes, completely. Completely. You don't want your your inside support staff or your accounting department or your customer service department getting on a virtual meeting and, you know, they, they, the camera's going up their nose to the ceiling or they're not quite put together. They're not looking at the camera. Or they're scowling the entire time. You want your team to represent in these meetings what your branding is and what you're about. And so I think it's really important that, that entire teams now really acquire these skills to the best of their ability that can make a difference. And it's skills they can take home and use. Their family will thank them if they actually know their resting face and are more effective communicators. Yeah, sometimes it's it's our facial expressions and what isn't said, right? It it is. And even, you know, we talked about the, the value of listening. The listening face is just as important as your speaking and communication face, because you'll notice people listening that maybe they look angry or confused or they're just scowling or they're distracted. We can all see that, especially in these virtual meetings. And if you're on TV or any kind of a broadcast, even more so. But that listening face, that active listening face is just as important because we're giving back that, hey, I'm with you. Hey, I can, I see you. I understand you. I care about what it is you're saying. You matter to me. You're important to me. You va- I value you as a client or as a, as a boss, whatever that is. Our faces are showing all of that, even when we're listening. Absolutely. And I, I'm fascinated to ask you, in your opinion, what qualities make a great communicator? Well, listening, <laughs> as we discussed, uh, understanding their message and knowing how to deliver it. I think a good communicator knows what is it I'm trying to relay? Is this message funny? Is it educational? Is it a warning of some kind? Is it inspiring? Anytime we're sharing something, it's got. we know what category it's going to fit into. And when we identify that category and can say what I'm going to share, and if it's using storytelling or facts or whatever that may be, that I'm used, I'm delivering this in a way 
that that message is going to be received that way. If I'm here to inspire you, then I better share it in a way that's inspiring. If I'm here to warn you about something or give you powerful information that's going to you know, change your life and, and it's strategic, then I need to deliver it in that way with those key talking points that are going to land correctly. And so I think an effective communicator knows what those talking points are, what those key words are. And then the next thing is how they deliver it. You could hear somebody say the exact same thing and how they use their inflection, how they put it out there, it could have a completely different landing or meaning than if somebody just kind of goes monotone like this and I'm just going to share it like that. It's not going to hit. It's almost song-like. You know, when you hear a great melody and you're just like, oh, that stuck with me. We want how we deliver something to resonate. And I see a lot of bad habits out there <laughs> in how people are delivering their communication and maybe almost getting lazy with it, using filler words and um, not thinking how they're articulating and not making it impactful. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you know, I mean, as I uh, shared with you earlier, as a part of having a, a disability, I have a group of uh, people that work with me in terms of support staff and uh, personal support workers to make sure that I'm physically fit and all that stuff. And sometimes when I am on the other side of the camera and being interviewed about my life, sometimes they ask me to bring uh, the people that work with me to get sort of a day in the life of my physical perspective. And so I have a, a group of support workers that work with me. And there's one that I work with that, that always signs up to do the double team podcast. And then, I've got another support worker who hates being in front of the camera, right? So right. My next question for you is how do you sort of work with people that are nervous, who are great at the business angle, but not sort of communicating the messages for TV and radio? I love that. That's a really, I, I love that you brought this up because you're right. There are those individuals that just say, nope, I'm not going to do it. I hate being on camera. It's not going to be me. And I, and I, I see those individuals all the time. And as I'm out there and working with people, what I'd like to do with them is say, okay, I understand you hate it, but it's necessary because if you can tell me you're never going to be on a video conference again, then we won't have this conversation. But if you are, I need you to meet me somewhere in the middle here and let's have this conversation. And then we work really on self-awareness. For those that are uncomfortable, self-awareness is the first place that we start. If I'm working with a client that's already really comfortable with themselves, but we're just really trying to craft their message and level it up, that's different. But when I go back to somebody who is, if the camera goes on and they're the ones that duck and hit the floor... I've got to start at the bare bottoms and work our way up. And that's starting to get comfortable with their face, their mannerisms, their body language. And the one thing that I say to them at that starting point is, it's the same face you take out in public every day. It's the same voice that you speak to people with. So first, we have to get comfortable with this face and voice because it's what you have. And we need, let's learn it together. Let's find what you like and what you don't like. Let's make adjustments if we need to. And once you start getting comfortable with yourself and we do some exercises to work on that, then we're going to go to step two and how to get comfortable doing those first on-camera moments and how to start seeing yourself and, and watching the tape back. And, there's, and I have different practical exercises that are kind of fun to go through that I can take an individual at least from zero to maybe five if they hated it, or at least four, and I would consider that a success. And those that come to me and they're already a five or a six, I'm going to get you to a 10. And that's what's fun is seeing where everybody's at at their own level and then creating those different learning points that we can at least get you to move forward. Anything forward is a, is a success in my yeah. mind. Yeah, meeting people where they are, right? Yes, small, yes. Small victories are better than none at all, right? Yes. Yeah, that's about celebrating wins, absolutely. So, Amy, I'm fascinated to ask you, how do you define your own strength, passion, and purpose? How do you define your why? I absolutely love what I do. For me, with this 20-year journey of watching all of these different touch points that have taken place throughout the year, they were always attached to individuals, especially my work with the veterans. Wow, that was powerful work that if I hadn't been comfortable with myself, 
I would have missed some incredibly beautiful life-changing moments. Times in sales where I was able to make a difference or provide for my children. Those are tangible moments that if I hadn't gotten out of my comfort zone, hadn't learned how to do this, I would have missed it. So to go over to my why, it's that I now have the beautiful opportunity of helping other professionals and other individuals have their moment. Taking them from here to here and saying, I've had my moments. I've been on some of the biggest stages there is as a performer. I've worked with some amazing professionals as a coach. I've been on national television. I've had these wonderful moments. What I get to do now is take those and help you have your moment. My why is seeing lives changed, seeing professionals level up their communications, which then goes right into their families. My favorite call is when I've worked with somebody professionally and they say, oh my gosh, my kids are so excited to see the difference in how I'm communicating. Or my husband has noticed that I'm, I'm communicating better and I'm more comfortable and confident. And this is, this is really actually helping my personal life. Uh, I had one client who actually used one of the techniques I gave her to reconnect with a sister that they had been estranged and now their relationship is back moving forward again after years of being estranged. Using these tools of communication, it is it definitely will absolutely seep into your personal life. And my why is all of those wins that yeah. I can say, wow. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I mean, the first uh, lesson that taught me in journalism school was Short, concise, and to the point. I could re recite, re recite the lecture in my sleep. So I, <laughs> I'm wondering your thoughts on how to de develop and deliver an impactful message that is concise but also uh, full of information. You know, the funniest way that I break this down is picture it's your birthday and I want to present you a cake. It's your birthday. I'm bringing you a cake. When I walk in the room in that cake, you do not make me, want me to say, so I present you the flour, the sugar, two eggs, some oil, some salt, baked at 350 for 25 minutes. You just want the cake. So when we're delivering our message, we need to think, what is the description of this cake? I want to say, here I present to you this beautiful chocolate cake with red velvet you know, filling. I want to get right to the point. And a lot of times when we go to do storytelling or delivering a message, we're telling all the ingredients of the cake. We don't need to do that. We want to describe the cake itself. We want that cake to be the blessing. And so taking and really thinking about what we're doing just in such a simple analogy like that can really help when you're crafting a message. All right, is this one of the ingredients or is this part of the cake? <laughs> and taking a look at that and saying, okay, that's going to help make a difference for me to really break this down in bite-sized manner that that will resonate with individuals so that they don't tune out. Let's get to the point. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, everybody's uh, attendance spans are getting shorter and shorter, aren't they? Yes, yes. Absolutely. And I know that you've spent a lot of time in the spotlight with your varying career. So I'm curious to ask you, how do you uh, succeed when you're under pressure and all the lights <laughs> Or on your end, you still want to maintain a certain level of dignity and privacy as well. I think that a big part for me is that who you see in the spotlight is who you see at home. I had somebody ask that to my daughter recently. We were somewhere at an appearance and they say, "Is let me ask you a question. Is she like this at home too? She says, this is exactly her. I'm not two different people. So if I can maintain that consistency in character and in drive, and as hard as I work in my business, is as hard as I work for my family. I put the same level of excellence in serving my family. So for me, I don't feel that my privacy is ever invaded. I'm very careful what I put out there, but I also am not living a double life that it's something in my personal life was out in public that I would mind. I'm very proud of my life, my family, my decisions, my journey. And I'm I'm upfront about my failures because we then hopefully somebody else can grow from that. I say I've paid the dummy tax for a lot of people. So I'm okay sharing that. And so for me, it's it's realizing what a blessing this is, that I've walked this journey enough that I do have a public life and a private life. And the more I can be thankful for both of those, then I don't see them separately. It's just life. Yeah, absolutely. And Erin, when you look at the whole totality of your career, I'm interested to ask you about your favorite professional moment, whether it be in sales, whether it be in music or television and media. What's your 
a defining moment in your career and something that you'll always cherish? Mm. There's been quite a few. One of them was definitely singing the national anthem on behalf of the Army at the 10-year anniversary of 9-11 in Dodger Stadium. That is one of the times that I cried at the end of the national anthem. It was a powerful, powerful event and one that I will absolutely cherish always, hands down. Second only, I think, to singing the national anthem to a room full of 3,000 soldiers and their families that were about to deploy. That was powerful. Those are what I say would be the two top that sit with me the most. Yeah, I can imagine having that impactful and emotional moments. Those are the ones that stick with you, aren't they? Yes. Yes, completely. Completely. And, and yeah, I talked earlier about inclusion in terms of, of employment and working with folks with disabilities, but I'm also curious to ask you in today's media landscape, how do you define the word uh, fairness and how do you think we can really uh, develop and create an inclusive culture where everyone is valued? Oh, that's a big question, Kevin. I mean, we, we all want that. Hopefully, if each one of us, I'm responsible for me. It's taking responsible for me to say, am I being fair and inclusive today? Am I trying to give, am, am I asking for help at the same time that I'm also saying, who can I bless today and what can I give today? And each, each one of us could look and say, how can we serve others today? Imagine just that different shift of a mindset to wake up thankful, thankful for the blessings that we do have, thankful for the lessons that I'm learning in each day. Thank you. Thankful for the obstacles that come at me because I have the tools to be able to handle it. If we could all just greet each day with thankfulness and say, how can I be a blessing today? We could see a different world. Absolutely. And uh, just to follow up to that, when you look at the world today, I, I'm curious, what uh, has you most hopeful for the future? And what are you uh, concerned about? And what do you think needs to be uh, sort of tweaked from a societal perspective? <sighs> We definitely need to be using these digital tools the right way. It breaks my heart when I see even social media and, and all the digital tools being used to spread hate or controversy or to stir things up. What I'd love to see is that we take these tools, because I wish I wish we had had these tools 20 years ago when I was touring and when I was doing other things. I wish I had had these amazing digital tools and media tools that we have today. Um, I do have them today. I'm trying to use them for good. And... So I think the hope is that those of us that want to use this for good can start being the louder voice and start shifting this narrative and turning the ship around a little bit. And my concern is definitely for our next generations and what they're facing, especially with cost of living and inflation and how hard it is to make it through today. I'm hoping that that we can start looking and saying, how can we support them better? How can we continue to give them opportunities so that they can also have a good quality of life and have a living wage and have hope in their life? I, I want to, at this age in life, I'm almost 50. I hope that at least to my own kids, I have four grown kids and two step kids, And I hope that I'm giving them opportunities for hope with what I do. Yeah, absolutely. Every, as a mom, you know, raising kids is what it used to be. So, Tell me, when, when you look at raising kids today, what's the one message that you hope your kids will implement in their life? That I accept and love them individually for their uniqueness, for their talents, for their voice, for their opinions, for their goals, for their dreams. I accept their failures. I'm going to celebrate as well, just the same way I'm now celebrating my failures. I hope that they know that there's that unconditional support on all aspects so that they can grow and become who they're supposed to be. Not what I want them to be, not what I think they should be, but give them the tools and the resources to be their very best and what they're supposed to be. Yeah, I always tell people that diversity of perspective is an asset, isn't it? Yes, it absolutely is. Absolutely. And, and, then, and then tell me you wrote a book called Lights, Camera, Action. So I'm wondering if you can tell me all, all about the book and what, what it's all about. 
Oh, that was a fun one put together. Now I know a lot of people wrote a book during the pandemic. So yes, I am one of those <laughs> because I'm highly ADHD. So the pandemic locking me up, I said, oh no, I'm definitely not going to just sit here. What I decided to do is realize I had, I had so many wonderful stories and examples of professionals that I had worked with throughout the years that had learned how to effectively communicate and had come up, gotten past their fear of being on camera. And here we're going through COVID and we're going through a lot down when everybody's on camera. So what I did is lights, camera, action is media coaching for professionals in today's digital world. And it was, it's for media coaching for any professional in today's digital world. And what I did is I reached out to those that I love and trust that are, were my clients, that were people that I know, colleagues of mine that are already experts in this space. And I, I asked them all to contribute their story. I shared some of the stories of clients I've worked with. I got great advice from some really amazing, wonderful people that some are you know, pretty well known. And I put this together to be this wonderful example of you can do it too. We can all grow in this area. We can all grow in our communication. We can all grow in our self-awareness and our confidence. And it was really fun to put together. And I'm so thankful for all of the contributors that were a part of it and that they allowed me to share their stories. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, my final uh, question for, for you is how I end every podcast that I do and ask, asking the guests what, when you look at your life, life history from a personal and professional uh, standpoint, how do you want that to be defined? You know, it's one word and it's funny because my name means this. The name Amy means love, beloved. I hope that my life is defined that I that I gave love, that I received love and that what I did was in love. The, that the business and the coaching that I do, my music showed love and passion. And my heart shows love and passion for my kids, my family, my colleagues, people around me, that I just am that light that somebody says, yeah, she loved. Absolutely. Amy, if you want to get connected with you personally or all the work work that you do, what's the best way they can do that? You can find me at amyscruggsmedia.com. Any of social media platforms or Amy Scruggs, Amy Scruggs Media, Amy Scruggs Music. Just Google Amy Scruggs and I promise you will find me. Absolutely. Well, Amy, from one communications major uh, to uh, the other, this is uh, my last podcast of the week and I couldn't uh, think of a better way to end uh, my week than engaging in conversation with you about all things communication, your work in the space, and Tom, on my behalf, is most appreciated. It was delightful having a chance to catch up with you this afternoon, and I want to thank you for being here. It was a pleasure to be with you, an honor to be here today. Thank you, Kevin.